ISD is an EU um, directive um, around the issue of um, yet another wonderful directive around the issue of cybersecurity. Um, it was translated in the UK into the network and information systems regulations. Um, we're saying at this point Brexit, no Brexit, makes no difference whatsoever. But the, the principle of it was that increasingly a number of our public services are dependent upon technology in order for them to deliver the services that, that they need. Those operators are becoming increasingly reliant upon that technology and therefore the UK public has to be reassured that in the event of technical failure or more specifically malicious attacks that those services will continue with the minimum levels of disruption. So it was important, it was felt that a framework was put around that. That is what the, the regulations cover. Worth saying at this point, this isn't about information. This is around operational resilience to services. And so therefore, in terms of defining what those public services, those essential services were, it's been determined that they are health, energy, that's oil, gas, electricity, transport of all types, maritime, air, roll, road, rail, provision of water, digital services and the digital infrastructure. Some may say, and it has been a subject of debate, hang on a minute, isn't banking a essential service in, in today's age? What about nuclear? It's worth mentioning that those sectors already have a significant amount of regulatory control around this and therefore it was felt at this point it was adequate. Those other services I mentioned aren't quite as mature in that space and that's why they sit at the vanguard of the new regulations which came into effect in uh, 2018. Well, I think it probably depends who you ask, but the, the, the fundamental basis is that it is absolutely important, absolutely critical that um, provision of public services continues unabated under whatever set of circumstances. Um, and as these public services are increasingly dependent on technology, the public needs reassurance that those services will be secure. Why is this important? It's important because the UK strategy is built around building an incredibly vibrant, vibrant digital economy. Um, and without that public assurance and confidence, that will inhibit the growth of that digital economy. And within that context, it's worth saying that in a recent international study, 70% um, of people generally believe that their nation's critical national infrastructure would be would be subject of a cyber attack and more importantly 50% of the general public felt that their respective governments were ill-equipped to deal with such an attack and those figures are consistent for the UK as well as more widely internationally so against that you know, it's absolutely right that the UK government starts building that confidence and reassurance within the public. If you ask the providers, if you ask the suppliers of those, those essential services, they would roll their eyes, say, God, not another regulation, here we go, what's all this about? But as a principle, I believe that they generally recognise what it, what it tries to achieve. Their doubt, their caution, comes around how that regulation will be implemented. Um, and how it will be governed. Therein lies the, the caution around the providers. Well, the service offer operators that we've spoken to I, you know, identify two fundamental risks in this. Actually, how are they going to be managed and regulated in um, implementing these, uh, this, this directive and these regulations? How bureaucratic is it going to be? What level of expertise is going to be applied to this? And therefore, are they confident that it will be regulated to the best effect? The second fundamental risk to them is, OK, how much is this going to cost us? What's the implementation cost of this going to be? How much disruption to our services are, are at risk through the implementation of these regulations um, and maintenance of those, of those regulations? And those, I think, are the two broad uh, risks as the service operators see them. Okay, so within this context, um, the way that it's structured is this. The National uh, Cyber Security Centre um, has developed an overarching set of principles and controls that will apply to all of those um, uh, sectors affected by the regulation. And those controls covers the areas of managing the risk, protecting against attack, detecting events, um, and minimising the impact should such an, uh, a dis disruption occur. Now, the National Cyber Security Centre 
recognize themselves that they're not experts in those sectors, not experts in health, not experts in energy, transport, and so on and so, so forth. So what they have done is they have delegated that regulatory role to what they, what they call competent authorities within each sector. So each sector has its own competent authority which will manage their the regulatory and audit frameworks for the sector concerned for example. So some of those are joint, so in the, for example in the area of subject of air transport, the competent authorities are jointly the Department for Transport and the CAA, the Civil Asia Aviation Authority. Now we all know if I, we go back to those categories there's a whole number of potential com companies in there. So what the, what the framework has done, what the National Cyber Security Centre has done and the regulation has done, have set thresholds. So thresholds of organisations of a particular size will be subject directly subject to those regulations, while providers who perhaps fall underneath that thre threshold will be given those regulations as good practice and it will be governed accordingly. So if we take an example of that, electricity supply in the UK, and the po so therefore the threshold is, would a uh, particular disruption or an attack disrupt the supply, the transmission or distribution of electricity to more than a quarter of a million customers? If a particular organisation um, falls within that threshold, then they will be subject to the, um, the regulations under the framework that the respective uh, competent authority has, has, has set. Now, at the moment, these thresholds are fixed, they're laid out in the directive, they will be kept under review, and there still is a discretion for the competent authority or indeed the National Cyber Security Centre to adjust that in the case of individual companies. So I think particularly as organisations grow, as they adjust this framework, these regulations will start to encompass more and more and more of the providers in those sectors and any other sectors that are, are sought to be introduced later on. Yeah, it is. I think it is tied to the first point because I think some of the operator, the, the operators we've spoken to, do have a degree of caution, you know, and in some cases scepticism about whether the competent authorities, whether they feel the competent authorities are in fact capable of implementing and, and setting a re regulatory framework within the tolerance of business interests as well as customer services. So I think that then ties into the well, how do we implement this, th this then? And so, I, I, and tied to that is what we see is a huge amount of frustration within these organisations, colossal frustration. They feel they've already spent a whole load of money on a lot of cybersecurity controls. They feel they get a lot of you know, conflicting advice about what good looks like. And so therefore, now they are regulated. Um, there's a little bit of concern here about what does good look like, how do we know what's good look like and whether the competence authorities can actually measure what good looks like. And so what I would say is our client, the clients we, we deal with and the other uh, um, wider group of organisations that an ISD applies to, I think they probably fall into two categories. First of all, there's the organisation that are on top of this, they know what it means, they know what the regulatory framework expects of them and they've already got it in place and they're, and they're comfortable with that. The second are groups of organisations who may be there but they still need some degree of help, they're still in that space about we're still really not quite sure what good looks like and they need some help and advice around that. The third category, which is a significant number of them are still sort of going we haven't really done very much about this, we're still really not quite sure what we're supposed to do, we haven't started, I don't have the time, I don't have the resources, I can't do the, the necessary uh, um, risk impact assessments and they are still moving quite slowly in this space. And the fourth category are those who sit just below that threshold um, but are growing and soon they will breach that threshold and quite often even they don't, aren't even necessarily aware of the regulations themselves, much less what they, what they, uh, what, what they comprise. Um, and so it's important that they themselves recognise um, what is going to be asked of them um, in line with their growth when they, breach, when they breach that threshold. So very different sort of sets of maturity, if you like, um, in this space. And that, I think, is why the community of interest that we're setting up is quite important, because it actually helps support organisations of all those types on how to implement the, these, these uh, regulatory controls with minimal operational disruption to achieve the end that it's trying to achieve um, and minimize the, the, the cost um, in, in the same way.
there is always external advice av available. Um, I think the challenge, the environment into which this, this, the NISD or the, the regulations are being introduced is into a backdrop of um, external advice which has always been built around a whole load of scare up mongering creating a lot of confusion and there is not a huge amount of confidence at the moment in external advisors um, in this space because of that. Um, there is generally felt that consultants, some consultancies are using organisations own lack of understanding and confusion around the landscape as a licence to print money um, and therefore are providing a lot of extraordinarily expensive advice which fundamentally doesn't move them forward. Um, from a personal point of view, I do have a little bit of sympathy around that. Um, I, you know, I personally find using something which is around the provision of public services, as a former public serv servant myself, using something around the provision of public services simply to be able to charge huge amounts of money for little or no impact benefits no one. It doesn't benefit the service providers and it certainly doesn't benefit the, 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 the end users as well. So I think that's the backdrop that external advice needs to be looked at. We've also seen, and GDPR is an absolute case in point in this, that the type of advice that's produced often results in unnecessary, expensive, and, and, and disruptive solutions in a way in which had they been implemented in a slightly different way um, needn't have looked like that. So, you know, I think a lot of organisations do need external advice but, but they've got to be very careful about who they choose to provide that advice. There are of course a lot of organisations don't need advice, they've got a lot of expertise, huge amount of expertise internally, they've got the skills and knowledge, so, and, but sometimes it's helpful for them to get a little bit of external validation. But the key thing around this if you want to be able to measure it is any help and advice that is brought in should be around helping the organisation use what measures and controls it already has in place and then filling the gaps. The second piece of advice which I think is critical to every single one of these providers of essential services is how do you keep that dialogue and engagement open with the competent authorities as an iterative pro uh, process um, to ensure a smooth implementation which satisfies the providers and satisfies the, the, the competent authorities at the same time. Um, and those, I think, are two very discreet, complementary pieces of advice um, that organisations, um, if they are looking externally, um, should look for. So if there was one single piece of advice I could give to an operator of essential services against, uh, within the context of these regulations is this. Look at what you've got. Every single engagement we have had in this space. Um, actually, when one looks at it carefully, some of the controls they already have in place for governing similar types of risk are quite easily purposed for this purpose, for, 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 this, for this intent. So look at the controls and mechanisms, internal controls and risk management that you already have and then build it around that. If any single advisor or external consultant comes to you and says, oh, you've got to build a whole new you know, sort of risk management framework around this, a whole new set of uh, a, a control processes, then show them the door. It is not necessary. In our, my experience, most organisations already have an awful lot of this already in place, which just needs a readjustment around, around risk management principles and a little bit of adjustment of, of, of controls in order to meet these regulatory requirements. You know, once again, this is the risk of bad advice turning implementation or, or, or compliance into a far bigger project than it ever needs to be, which causes massive business disruption and unnecessary cost and distraction to these, purposes, these services which by their definition are essential. So I think that would be the key piece of advice I would give to any organisation. Use what you already have. You would be surprised actually how much of these controls you already have in place for similar or other reasons. So the reason we, we decided to sort of build this community of interest um, was I think to learn from the lessons of, of GDPR. So GDPR, which of course is in effect, was introduced at the same time as NISD, it was a sister organisation but it got the sister regulation but got an awful lot more public profile. Um, what we've seen um, Across, across the whole spectrum of implementation of GDPR. It was poorly introduced, it was 
the advice that was given was in some cases woefully inadequate and organisations ended up having to put in place far more measures than they needed to do, spend far more money than they needed to do and actually disrupted their own business disproportionately um, to what the GDPR was, was trying to achieve. Now GDPR of course covered millions and millions of, 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 of different organisations and ISD by its very definition is, is far fewer and I just want to avoid that similar situation. So I think the purpose of the community of interest is, a, is, is to facilitate discussion regardless of sector around the implementation, share knowledge, share practice, share principles, share experience, advice, share interesting background information documents and articles so actually there is a common set of understanding and appreciation of the challenges and opportunities in implementing this and what the most effective way of engaging um, the regulators or the competent authorities um, actually are. If that happens it will result in a far smoother, far less disruptor, disruptive, far cheaper implementation for all affected organisations um, and create minimal disruption and cost um, to the services that the public rely upon. And I think that's the purpose of, of, of setting it up actually as a community of help and support against what a lot of people, going back to a point I made earlier, what a lot of organisations just see as yet another cybersecurity regulation and set of controls in another space in an already fairly confused landscape.